he goes to the first sermon that he gave three to. He doubled, now he has six. Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've done good with what you have, now you receive a lot more. Second guy he goes to, instead of two talents, now he has four. Same thing, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've done well with what I gave you, and now receive more. The third guy, this is not such a good part of the story. He said, because he got as as a hard and coarse and and not so good words that he used to describe our God, but he buried it in the dirt and brought back to him his one talent. That guy was cast out into the darkness and gnashing of teeth. No matter whether we have spiritual gifts, talents, a a gift that we have that we can never repay, which is the gift of salvation. And what we do with that stuff along with our finances, we have to answer for. I would like a month of Sundays to preach on this scripture, but I'm not your preacher, so that's probably a good thing. There's so much in it. And so I invite you guys to go back and read it. But we are held accountable for what we do with what we have. Would you please pray with me? Lord God, we thank you so much for your son that you sent him to die for us. Matt talked about spiritual gifts last week. Man, we all have spiritual gifts. Some of us don't even know what they are, but we need to ask God to show us so we can use those spiritual gifts to help further his kingdom, help further your word, help further truth and enlightenment and of your glory to others. Lord God, I just pray you'd be with us and be with Pastor Matt, speak through him. Help all of this service to be to your glory. We love you and we praise you in your name. Amen. Ready our hearts for communion. We're going to sing the beloved hymn, Amazing Grace. I can never sing this song without remembering the background of the music and the words by John Newton. As we remember, he was engaged in a despicable practice 
of catch for capturing natives from West Africa to be sold as slaves to markets around the world. But one day, the grace of God put fear into his heart of this wicked slave trader through a fierce storm. Greatly alarmed and fearful of a sh shipwreck, Newton began to read The Imitation of Christ by Thomas A. Kempis. God used this book to lead him to a genuine conversion and a dramatic change in the way of his life. And until the time of his death, at the age of 82, John Newton never ceased to marvel at the grace of God that transformed him so completely. Shortly before his death, he is quoted as proclaiming with a loud voice during a message, My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things, that I'm a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. What amazing grace. Shall we sing? song I got caught up in the lyrics so much I almost forgot what I was getting ready to do up here if you're here this morning and you're a visitor we welcome you to this time of our communion regardless of your denomination or church affiliation if you are a believer in Jesus Christ our Savior we invite you to share in this communion with us many times I share quotes with you guys, and it's not because uh, I'm just looking for one, but I find that many times people say things better than I can say them myself. This one comes from George Foreman, the inventor of the grill. <laughs> when I was a boxer in 1970s, I was punched in the face by Joe Frazier knocked out by Muhammad Ali, and knocked down a few times by Ron Lyle before I got up and won. 
All the fights had one thing in common. When they were over, I couldn't remember the pain. I forgot about my weak, my weak knees, the cuts, the blood in my eyes. Without the films, my fights would have completely taken them out of my mind. It's the same thing when you're going through tough times. Don't let pain and disappointment lodge inside. Follow-up scripture that I'm using this morning comes from Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. And Lord, when I say a beautiful day, it makes me think of the heat that we had endured just weeks ago, Father, of the cold winds that we will see in the weeks to come. And Lord, that reminds me of the fact that seasons come and seasons go. And Lord, when we come out into the beautiful days, we recognize that you are with us through the hard times and that we can appreciate your glory when we come to the good. And Father, as we keep that in mind, Lord, we thank you for the price that was paid on the cross for our sins so that we may spend eternity with you. Lord, this bread that we take represents his broken body. This cup that we take represents his blood that covers those sins that we cannot cover ourselves. So we thank you. Forgive us for the times that we fail you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may take your elements.
Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Arnie, on that word on giving, it's, I don't, I don't know if you realize where we were going to be in the next verse, and he's shaking his head no. So this is divine, these words of Scripture and this perspective that you've shared on that word of giving. I want to say uh, good morning to everybody that's watching at home. I, I see your messages, and I, it's, uh, it's just neat to know that you're here with us. And Grandpa Bob, he's sending his love. Uh, Emma, she says hello and misses everyone. And I know Gammy's watching, and Harriet, and Mike and Carol, and everyone in between. So we're just so glad that you guys join us uh, each, each week and expand these walls. This is not the limit of our church. This room is not the limit. This property is not the limit. Nash is not the limit. God is the limit, and therefore limitless. Amen? Well, this morning we're in First Peter, because I know that since February of 2022, you've loved this letter, right? It is amazing. It is, brother. It is. And the more and more I study it, the more and more I just see the richness of every word of this scripture being so applicable, extremely applicable to, to us. That's the beautiful thing about what Peter's doing. He's writing as such a practical letter to us. I'll give you a little history. As we move into this portion of scripture in verse 12 and 13, it's, it's a section in my Bible called sharing or share, share the sufferings of Christ. We, we each share in those sufferings. We look at Christ, we look at everything he did for us, and we see that suffering. When we partake of the communion, every Sunday as I reflect on what that means, taking these elements and remembering exactly that suffering, it really sinks in. And, and actually, I, I feel sorry for places that don't do it every week. I find the, the conviction of communion to be more powerful than probably anything I do each week. Just, just that moment of focusing on what that looks like and what that means and how it re regenerates my spirit's desire for the Lord. We look at the suffering of Christ in that. We see his broken body represented in the elements and the bread. And we see his blood poured out in the in the elements of the wine or the juice. And that's convicting. Because I've been called, and you've been called, to partake in that. You partake in the communion, you partake in that suffering. And that's a lot what Peter is saying to us here. This letter comes from a fisherman. A simple fisherman that God chose for a very, very powerful word, just as he does you, just exactly as he does each of you. The year is A.D. 64. A.D. 64, this letter was written by a fisherman named Peter. Rome has burned Perhaps maybe as Peter is writing this letter, he's watching the smoke rise and the fires flicker throughout Rome. It's believed that he wrote this letter sometime near the burning of Rome. Can you imagine the perspective in writing a letter like this? In a, in a place like Rome? A place where the, the power of the Roman Empire is on full display? The authority of the culture is all there, wrapped around man and his shrines and his armies and his power and his authority and his architecture and the Colosseum and all the great minds that have come together on the earth come to Rome and they're in this powerful empire and it's on fire and it's burning. Hmm. Interesting perspective from Peter, isn't it? The people of Rome have lost everything. Everything's in ruin. Everything's in ashes. 
And in spite of the people trying to, to band together and put out the flames and put out the fires of this great city, the flames keep popping up. They put one out over here and they go over here and they come back and the flames start it up again. Because of the, the king's order to his own people to reignite the fires, it seemed. King Nero, an ancient madman, needing to blame somebody for this burning city, points the finger and he puts the crosshairs on the Christians. This awkward band of people that just don't fit in. This awkward group of people that do these weird things, that don't follow the cultural norms. This group of people that do something completely different than worship Artemis. An odd group of people that Nero points the finger at. Why the Christians? Why them? Why are they receiving the attention for the burning of Rome? <laughs> well, for one, they, they were very misunderstood. That's to say the least. They were accused of cannibalism because people didn't understand the, the communion. They didn't understand what Jesus meant when he said, take my flesh, take my blood. They completely misunderstood that. In many places they still do. They were accused of ruining marriages, Christians were, because unfaithful spouses were cast out, and so on and so on. They were accused of all kinds of slander. So Christians became the target of the worst kind of persecution any believer could ever know. They were sawn in half. They were stoned to death. They were stitched and sewn into animal skins, then told to run off into the forest, and a, a band of wild animals hunted them down, tearing them limb from limb, these poor Christians. They were tied up with ropes that were tied to horses and pulled apart and dismembered. They were rolled in pitch and lit on fire and stuck on stakes to light the king's garden, the burning body of a Christian. Human torches giving that garden a horrendous ambiance. And worst of all, Christians were subject to the most gruesome torture mankind has ever created, ever known. They were crucified. That's what was happening when Peter wrote this letter. That's the landscape that Peter was looking out across as he was writing this letter. That's why I feel it's so important for us, us to understand why he wrote this letter to his brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the daily life for a Christian in AD 64, 65. They were the targets. They were slandered. They were persecuted. They were murdered on a routine basis, and Peter is writing to them to keep them aware of what's really important in that kind of environment, in that kind of culture. He, he wants to keep their eyes set on Christ. It's 30 years later after Christ had ascended. He's been gone for three decades now. There's probably a sense of hopelessness amidst all that persecution. And here we are, 1,980 years later, 60 years later, somebody do the math. 
So we can only imagine the hopelessness that some people feel when they're enduring trials, when they're going through difficult times. AD 64 just marks the beginning of what would end up being another 200 years of this kind of persecution on Christians. And loved ones, it hasn't quit. It hasn't stopped. And so here we are reading a letter so powerfully inspired by God through Peter so that we can learn something from this and we can apply it to our life. Peter says, chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, that right there just sets the tone. It's out of pure love, agape love for one another that he's writing this letter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for testing, your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. So that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. I've got to stop right there because just these two verses demand so much attention. Peter says, don't be surprised at this fiery ordeal, as though he's writing, watching these flickering flames of Rome burning before them. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. As a Christian, the name implies it in itself, you follow Christ. As a Christian, you follow Christ. Jesus said they hated me and they persecuted me so if you follow me they will hate and persecute you as well john the oldest living apostle in ad 90 some 30 years after peter wrote this letter reminds people then it's a constant reminder in scripture by those apostles, as long as they had breath in their lungs, they were reminding people, don't be surprised. John writes in his first letter, as he's imprisoned, 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. It's a constant reminder for the Christian not to be surprised about this persecution. Not to be surprised about the rejection sometimes that we feel. Not, be, not to be surprised when you're fired. I really wasn't surprised. I'll tell you a little story about my own life. I was working in Oklahoma City driving back and forth spending a good four hours on the road, and in that time, I asked the Lord to, to, to make that time fruitful, that it wouldn't just be driving time, listening to sports talk or, you know, the greatest country hits of all time or something like that, or maybe even a little old school, old school rock and roll, maybe, I don't know. And, and I was zipping through the station at 6 a.m. one morning, going down 132, and I come across that AM 800 radio station. You guys know it. Some of you bought radio network. Every 30 minutes, a new sermon, a new pastor, the word of God preached 24 hours a day. And so I said, this is it. This is the station I'm going to listen to. I'm going to use these four hours every day, and I'm going to listen to four hours of pastors preaching every day. Well, you know, this is back 2014. I wasn't even a pastor, had no desire to be a pastor. Operations guy working at a factory making food. I'd been doing that for 10 or 15 years, and I thought, oh, that's where he wants me. That's where I'm going to go. But, but I'd just come out of a trial, been sued by people for things that they felt that were not good in terms of we were doing some things, a little construction business. Um, the nation was going through difficult times, 2008, recession. Banks quit lending, all kinds of turmoil. Just coming out of all of that, 
Dan O'Daniel was my pastor. Kept me in line. I, I, I screamed and yelled about every unfair injustice I'd ever been given during those years. And Dan, four years. But there was one day I got a phone call from my wife. She said, you know, we were out walking. Sister-in-law Penny. They were out walking. And Brandy, the sweet little German short hair bird dog, was going with them on a walk. My neighbor, you know how we do things in Carrier. We walk and our dogs come with us. We don't keep them on a leash, you know. It's the normal small town culture thing. They were walking along the, the road there, not too far from our house, and they have Brandy out just weaving around, ditch to ditch in front of them, and we hear this big boom. Somebody shot Brandy. A, a man down the street had some chickens, and he felt like maybe Brandy, being a German short hair, was going after those chickens. But I'd never seen her do that. She'd never had a feather in her mouth. I couldn't even take her to quail hunt. She didn't like guns. She was a pet, <laughs> the girl's first pet. Didn't kill her. She ran home and lost an eye in the ordeal. She's still kicking today, Brandy, amazing bird dog. When I got that call, I was in Oklahoma City. I was concerned that the person was shooting that close to my wife and my sister-in-law. I got in my car, and I drove 100 mile an hour to carry her. I just left work. I put that car right in that man's chair in his yard. I pulled up in his yard, and I drove right through the grass and right where he was sitting in front of his shed and parked my car right on the back side of that chair. It was all I could do not to just keep driving. I was so angry. And I was going to settle this, the good old country way. That was the old Saul in me. I got out, and it was just, oh, you know, and I said, what in the world are you thinking? You shoot my dog, and my wife and my sister-in-law are walking right there, you know, and I think there had been some drinking going on. It was all I could do. And from that moment on, I was just trying to think of ways to repay just to repay that man for what he'd done. And I was scheming in my heart every evil intention, every vile thought, every anger, fury, wrath. It was all just stirring in me. And finally, the Lord just got a hold of me and he just slapped me around and said, Look, <laughs> this isn't yours. This is a lesson, this is a trial. And he slowly brought me out of that. Fast forward five, six, seven, eight years later, and I'm sitting at a boardroom table, and I'm getting somebody sliding a piece of paper over. You flip it over, and it says, these are your termination papers. We no longer need your assistance here. You've been let go. And you go from the response of wanting just to reach across there to strangle the guy who shot the dog and almost shot my wife to the response that he gave me that moment, and the response was this. Thank you. God bless you. And you get up and walk out. Hey, that's what trials do, folks. They, they take you from the angry, resentful, hating, wrathful person to the person that just says, all right, God bless you. And, you, and then you look at the Lord and you say, where are we going now? What do you have for me now? That's what trials do. We, we shouldn't be surprised, Peter says, when these things happen to us. We, we shouldn't be surprised because Jesus said himself, don't be surprised. In John chapter 15, through, uh, 15 verses 18 and 19, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, said this to us. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, listen to that. If you were of this world, if you were a part of that Roman Empire and that culture and all the defiled things that they were doing, he says the world would love you. It would love you if you would go out and do all those 
defiling, dishonorable, unholy, and unrighteous things. It would love you to come join them in a bath of sinful behavior. It would love you to come to their party and be everything except holy. But Jesus says, but because you are not of the world, amen is right, because you, in fact, are not of this world. But I, Jesus says, chose you out of all of this mess. Because of this, the world hates you. <laughs> are you okay with that? I'm okay with it. I'm grateful for it. He chose you and me out of all of this mess. Now we're here, and we've got to endure this mess. We've got to endure the persecution. We've got to deal with the slander, and we've got to deal with the things that, you know, why would you shoot my dog, you know? We've got to deal with these things, and they're not always good and right and everything, but we've got to deal with it in the right way. And we've got to remember that we've been chosen out of all of this we're not part of this system. We're not part of this world that is passing away. We're part of a kingdom that is eternal. And we're citizens of that kingdom. And we're here to represent that kingdom as holy and righteous children of God, chosen by Christ, chosen by the Father to represent Him. And, it, and it's not going to be a cakewalk. It's, it's going to be challenging. You're going to have that day when you get the call that something bad's happened, and you might be like I was and say, oh, I'm going to let the fury fly here. But you've got to be transformed because that's not what Jesus did. As Jesus hung on the cross, he said, forgive them for what they've done because they don't know what they're doing. That guy didn't know what he was doing. Had one too many Bud Lights. He thought that dog was a pheasant. <laughs> I don't know. But I know how I'm supposed to respond. You know what my wife said? She goes, you know, you should go down there to those guys. Start a Bible study with them. <laughs> She's exactly right. She's exactly right. She goes, maybe they need to hear something from maybe, maybe that was how God wanted to bring you guys together through a nice little gentle conversation. Good thing you didn't drive over his chair. <laughs> She's exactly right. She should be preaching. That's why you women are so important to us men. But Peter's telling us these are the things that we're going to deal with as Christians because we follow Christ and because the world didn't like what Christ said to them, because what was he telling them? Listen, you're sinners, you're broken, but I'm here to save you from all of that. I'm here to give you a better way. But man didn't want that, right? They wanted the darkness where they could hide in their evil agendas and their evil ways. Fallen man is fallen. People aren't sinners because they sin. They sin because they're sinners, inherently. And that's the problem with mankind. That's the problem with all of us. That's why I was so mad when that happened. Jesus reminds us, if you were of the world, they'd love you, but you're not. I chose you out of the world because I chose you. And so it is for Christians. We're hated, we're persecuted by an unbelieving world because we are not of the world and we are chosen by God out of this world. And Peter says this is the way it's supposed to be. So don't be surprised, he says. It's echoed in what John wrote in, in his first letter. Don't be surprised when a fiery ordeal comes upon you. This is okay, loved ones. It's okay. It's supposed to be this way. It's all part of God's plan for your salvation. You, you have to understand 
this is part of his plan for your salvation. This trial, this thing that you're going through, the challenges of it, it's not just random. It's for your good. Peter, no doubt, was there when Jesus said these words in Matthew 10, verse 22. Jesus sat there and probably watched Christ speak these words. Jesus says, you will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. You've got to endure these trials. You can't compromise. You can't vacillate as a Christian. You've got to be bold and stand firm. Stand firm in your faith. Don't, faith, don't back down. You've got to endure it. And you've got to endure it to the end. And why? What does he say? For my name's sake. For the name of Christ. Not for me. It's not about me. I had that conversation with one of our high school basketball players last week. Look, this isn't about you. This isn't about you. This is about him. This is about you using what he's given you and giving him glory. It's all about him. It's always about him. It has nothing to do with me. Everything we do, we do for him. It's all about him. We endure trials for him. We suffer for him, for his name. It's always about Jesus. It's always for him. It's always for his glory that I will endure the fire for him. It's not about me. It's not about any agenda I have. It's always about him for his name because of my name, Jesus said. You've got to endure to the end. There's purpose in our trials in our lives, loved ones. There's so much purpose in it. Peter explains that. He says they, they come for our testing. They come to test you, challenge you. What's being tested? What was being tested when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't bow down? Their belief. And what, what, what happened? A fiery furnace. Your faith is always the test in your trials. Trials will show you how strong your faith is or how weak it is. It'll show you your strengths and it'll show you your weaknesses. They have purpose for that. They showed me my wrath and anger that wasn't righteous. It wasn't holy. There was nothing good in my thoughts towards that man. It was wrong. If I'm going to call my Christian, I can't, myself a Christian, I can't be like that. And he showed me that. And the next time I was faced with another challenge, maybe even a greater one, what are you going to do for income, you know? I have nothing. And I said, God bless you? That was, that was my response this time? Yeah, because he changed me. Because he needed me to be that way when I responded like that. He, he needed that to go away and this to be lifted up. That's what trials do. They transform us. It's, it's like an athlete Bella, who competes. Coach. It's like an athlete. It's like someone who's a competitor. The competition does what? It tests them. Paul writes about this a lot. When my basketball players, when they step out on the court, when Coach Claflin's football team steps out on the field, when Arnie, when he coached, when those players step out prepared for that competition, they're not surprised. They're not surprised when the competition challenges them. They're not surprised by that competitive test. In fact, they anticipate it, because I know these are great coaches. Our kids anticipate the challenge that is before them when they step out there to be tested. They're prepared for it. They anticipate it, and in fact, they embrace it. They're like, bring it on so that I can see where I'm weak and where I can be better. 
They embrace it. They, they enter into the test with confidence because they've prepared for it. They work for hours and hours and hours preparing for the trial, for the test. And loved ones, that's what we should be doing too. As Christians, we should be hours and hours and hours of reading the divine playbook, if you will. Preparing for the test of life. Knowing how to deal with the challenges. And knowing that the outcome reveals your faith. That's what Peter is simply telling us what to do. He's, that's what he's telling us. We should expect trials. We shouldn't be surprised. They shouldn't catch you off guard as a believer. You should understand that they're coming. Like Kim Olson said the other night at the Women's Fellowship, she said you're either in a trial, coming out of a trial, or getting ready to go into one. And that's the fact of life. They're refining us day by day. We shouldn't be afraid of them. We shouldn't back down from them. We should know that God's in it with us through these trials. He's not left you and abandoned you and set you in a trial and then turned his back. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what did they see? People looked in and they see these three figures and, oh, look, there's a fourth one. He's right there with you. He doesn't put you in the furnace and walk away. He puts you in the furnace and not even a hair gets burned. That's what he does. And then everybody says, oh, these are some amazing children of God. People look at that in awe. Untouchable. It's like that verse Arnie shared with us, Romans 8. Nothing, nothing can come between us and the love of our Savior. But why? Why? can't we just have it simple? Why can't we just have a rosy walk in the park in this life and then just go to heaven? <laughs> Why can't it be so nice? Why couldn't it just be simple like that without challenges, with, with, without cancer and sicknesses and illnesses, without broken promises, without broken homes, without financial ruin, without broken hearts? Why can't we just have it all and live a happy, peaceful life? Why do we have to suffer? Peter tells us. Peter says in verse 13, why? He says, but to the degree, to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with, with exaltation. We share in the eternal life of Christ. We share in that salvation. He's given it. We have it. And it can't be taken away from, it, from us. We, we have that. It's everlasting. Moths can't break in and steal. Nothing, nothing can take it away from you. You've been chosen for it. You've been given it. And you have it. And that's real, and that's certain, and that's in your future. You have that. Your home will someday be in heaven. And you have that now. You have the knowledge of that, and you have the certainty of that now. I don't know about you, but knowing where I'm going to be for, e for eternity gives me a great joy. that I can rejoice with exaltation with. But until then, we have to share also with his suffering. We have to share the sufferings of Christ because we're his followers. We share in the eternal life with Jesus Christ because we follow him, right? We all, we all should also have to partake in the sufferings of Christ as his followers. Why? Why? so that at the revelation of, of his glory, we may rejoice with exaltation. The word revelation means when his glory is revealed, when we see it, when it comes before you and your eyes see his glory. That means his presence is there. It means your presence is there in his presence 
right before you. <laughs> it's revealed when he comes. His glory is going to be fully revealed. Right now, his glory is in heaven. It's in our hearts. It's in his word. But there's going to be a day when this world is no longer this world. And in that day, you're going to be in the presence of God Almighty, Jesus Christ, the angels, every believer. And oh, what a glorious day to set your heart on when you're going through a trial. You're going to rejoice with exaltation, Peter says. You, it's unspeakable and indescribable what you're going to see. And that's coming. And so this little trial right now has no significance in that. It's so temporary. A wave tossed, a vapor, a flower. That's our life. The eternity is forever. And we rejoice at that glory when we see it face to face. We see Christ face to face. That's what he's saying. Presence with the, with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and everyone in heaven forever. That's how you get through trials. That's what the testing's for. To keep your eyes set on the prize. You get knocked down, you get back up. You forget about the pain. You move on. Your dog gets shot. You forgive him and move on. You go start a Bible study with him. All right? That's, what, that's, that's the holy behavior that he's called us to. Listen to this. Acts chapter 5, verse 41. I'll close here. Listen. The apostles, they were constantly being slandered, right? Constantly being mocked. Like I said, they were... They were killed. They were crucified. The one who wrote this letter, Peter, he was crucified upside down after he sat there and had to watch his wife be crucified. So Josephus says. So here's the apostles <laughs> going out and doing their thing, doing what they've been called to do, just like you. You're no different. You're not off the hook. <laughs> You've got a job to do. You can't take it lightly. The apostles are going around. They're preaching. They're, they're teaching. And oh, so here, here it is. We pick it up in verse 41 of Acts chapter 5. The apostles left the Sanhedrin. They'd been gathered up and they're getting beat again and they're getting slandered and they're getting told never to speak the name of Jesus again. Don't you do that. I've had HR people tell me that. <clears throat> That's why I'm here. It works out great. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. When you get slandered and you get persecuted, you can consider yourself worthy when you do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Are you found worthy? Are you rejoicing, you and your, your brothers, your band of brothers and sisters, as you go and you share these truths? They were rejoicing. They had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus Christ. They thought that was great. You know, sometimes we think that we're doing a good job when no persecution's coming. We think, man, I'm just, man, God really blessing me because but you might sit there and say, well, when have I shared the word with somebody that might be in opposition to it? <laughs> when was the last time you were before the Sanhedrin? Because of what you were doing for Christ? Sometimes we've got to correlate that a little bit. Sometimes we just got to understand what it means to embrace persecution for the name of Christ and understand that it shouldn't be a surprise when it comes because this is the world we live in, loved ones. There's your introduction to this amazing section of trials from Peter. We're going to dig into this deeper each week until the Lord says, I'm ready for you to move on. Trials are such a big part of our lives. They challenge us. They hurt. I was up in the hospital talking with Mike, and I said, you know, these trials, they have a way of refining us. God's molding us. He's getting rid of everything that's, that's not important. He's getting your heart set on him, focused on him. But I said, it sure does hurt. And he goes, you're right, it hurts. You're right, it hurts. 
but just know that God's with you in it and through it. And there's going to be a day, like Arnie said, when the sun comes out, a season of change. There's going to be a day when, when, you, when you get that, that little conference letter and you say, well, all right, I don't have a job. God bless you. So be it, because God knows. God knows. He knows everything you're dealing with right now. He understands it. He feels the pain. He understands it. He knows what you're going through. And he hadn't left you and he hasn't forsaken you. But you've got to give him all your trust and all your heart. And he'll get you through that trial. Let's close with a, with a word of prayer real quick. Gracious and Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful word you've given us. I just ask for your blessing to move and your spirit to move in these hearts. Every one of us has gone through trials. Some of us are going through immense trials right now. All kinds of challenges and difficulties, Lord. And, and Father, we, we know that they're for our good, that they refine us, that they shape us into being everything that you want us to be. Help us see that. Help us embrace it. And help us be transformed into what it is that you want us to be for your glory. And let us rejoice. Rejoice at the knowledge of where we're going to be forever with you in heaven. And we give you all that praise. We give you all that glory. And we lift it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I, uh, I'd like to introduce a little gift that I've been given by our youth. They, um, they told me last week they'd like to do some, some singing. It's, I use this excuse all week long, uh, helping my brothers on that construction project. I said, guys, it's Pastor Appreciation Week, or month, I guess. Yeah, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. And I said, so I'm going to sit here and I'm going to watch you guys work and appreciate your work. It didn't work. They didn't, they didn't let that happen. So uh, Pastor Appreciation Month is, you know, is what it is. But today, uh, if you guys would come up, this is a song these guys sing and, um, at, at youth on Sunday nights. We'll probably be singing it tonight. We'll have to open up the, the doors one of these evenings and let the whole town hear. <clears throat> Listen, kids, I'm going to ask you a question. It's a question I ask my basketball players, my, my, my kids at school. Who do you sing for? For him. Amen. All right, guys. Can't wait to hear. And you know, Larry, I, I went long. Would you mind closing us with? Yeah. Hey, we are more worship leaders than performers. So would you please stand up and worship with us? You might know this song. If you know it, sing it out.
to let you burst forth from us your light, your glory, your love your gift of salvation that you want us to share with everybody else Lord just guide us and direct us to do your will in your name I pray, amen would you please join me in the Lord's prayer our Father who art in heaven now will be thy name and thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven You are dismissed. Thank you.